Today, I'd like to introduce our forum speakers are Christian Branscombe and Gunnar Johnson. And at age 19, a Christian committed a crime that would change his life. On his 21st birthday, uh, he was sent to prison, convicted of first degree murder, and sentenced to life without possibility of parole. He served 24 years before Governor Jerry Brown with historically unprecedented uh, mercy commuted his sentence in 2018. Today, Christian is an independent coach working to build resilience through unpacking trauma, disappointment, and shame. And he does this work because he was saved by the work. John, John, uh, Gunnar Johnson spent two decades struggling with PTSD and its final injury after being shot multiple times in 1994. Gunnar will share the restorative uh, justice journey meeting uh, his uh, perpetrator, Christian Branscombe, to relive and heal the traumas that happened 23 years after the shooting. And Gunnar and Christian have become close friends. The genesis, genesis of this restorative justice program can be seen on CNN's The Redemption Project, which highlights Gunnard's experience as a victim of gun violence and his healing journey that led to forgive the person who harmed him and to advocate for his release. And Gunnar and Christian will discuss ongoing prison reform ad, uh, ad, advances and helping formerly incarcerated uh, prisoners re-enter Sac State through Project Rebound. Please help me welcome Christian Branscombe and Gunnar Johnson as today's forum speakers. Gunnar? Thank you, Ken. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Gunnar Johnson. Um, a little bit of backstory. We're going to watch the actual dialogue between Christian and myself. It's commonly uh, known as a uh, victim offender dialogue in restorative justice. I actually learned about this um, process my first semester here on campus after serving 18 years in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I took Dr. Awazi's restorative justice class. He's the chair of our criminal justice department. And during that process, I received a 40 page amends letter from Christian. And um, it gave me a lot of insight into the work that he had done during his incarceration and kind of how our lives had paralleled. A little bit about the backstory, um, you know, at the age of 20, my parents were both emeritus professors here. And um, like uh, most youth, I rebelled and didn't want anything to do with school. And, uh, um, I discovered the Grateful Dead at the age of 15. I was on the road. And uh, yeah, and so um, I got involved in the drug business, you know, selling and growing marijuana. And at the age of 20, I was the victim of a home invasion robbery that Christian perpetrated with uh, another close friend of mine, actually, Joshua Richter. Um, I was shot twice. I was shot in the face and through the shoulder. Um, I have a bullet still in my neck between C3 and 4. Um, this was my introduction to opiates. At that point, you know, I smoked a lot of pot, drank a lot of beer. Um, but it really sent my life in a downward spiral. And about five years later, I really, I, knowing full well how that crime impacted my family, myself, I committed a very similar offense where somebody was shot. Um, and we'll talk about that trauma reenactment, that trauma cycle a little bit in our presentation. But I'll give Christian a, a chance to introduce himself. So hopefully you hear me now. We can. I will mute my speaker over here. Maybe that'll help. No. All right. So I feel like Gunnar has uh, done a great job of showing where this story began. And uh, we're going to show the last part of the Redemption Project to, to give you an idea after 23 years where Gunnar had done a tremendous amount of work and was willing to come in and, and share space with me. And I had uh, really had a, a a lot of inner work that I had done and had a great intention to offer him and Patrick's family something meaningful. And we had a really transformative moment and I look forward to sharing the rest of the story with you after this. Forget about everything that's happening outside of this circle. Really take a moment to center ourselves. Okay. So, um, Gunnar asked that uh, we open up by him getting to know a little bit about the routine here. So, Right. Gunner so, just wanted to know how you were know doing. What and your routine's like? I mean, I spent a decade and a half locked up, so I know a little bit about the daily routine. 
I would say routine is my life, you know, like yeah. uh, I get up around four o'clock every day, I kind of meditate. Sometimes I write letters, sometimes I journal. From there, about 6.30, they open the door, I get out, take care of the dog, feed him, go to chow, you know, do the hustle and bustle. And you've facilitated a program that helps with inmate accountability. And how long have you been doing that for? That's been about a year and a half of real heavy lifting, man. Okay. Like that's not a, it's not a casual course. I designed it, I created it. Gunnar, can I ask you to share how the crime impacted your life? I mean, um, first, I, it was my first introduction to opiates. You know, I have a bullet in my neck still. I was, um, started pain pills, and then um, in 97, about two years later, two and a half years later, I started smoking heroin, um, became a heroin addict. You know, eventually I robbed a bank to support that ha habit and ended up in federal prison. And I don't blame you entirely, but that was a pivotal moment for sure. I mean, I was a pot dealer before that, and, and, and that was part of my crime. You know, I had two marijuana priors, but God, it sent me in a horrible direction. Not only did it impact me and, of course, Pat, who's no longer here, our families, your family, Josh's family. Did you carry some guilt over Patrick's? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if you realize, but Pat, the only reason he was on my couch was because we drank that night, and I told him he could crash on the couch. You end up getting killed because I was, you know, selling pot, and you guys decided to target me. Man, this guy would be alive today if if I didn't offer the couch, or maybe if I wasn't selling pot, or you know, you know. There's nothing that justifies me coming into your space and doing that, and nothing you could have done would have prevented that. That was that's that's mine to own. There is nothing in this whole situation that isn't my responsibility. And you need to, to really feel that. Yeah, I do. It's, a, it's an ugly cycle, bro. Yeah. It's an ugly cycle, you know? And, and I don't, not many people make it out of it, man. You know, if you really look around you and you look at the people that, that have gone through the stuff that we've gone through and done the things that we've done, bro, they can't live with what's been done to them and they can't live with themselves for doing it. Yeah. And that was another question, like, Josh was a really good friend of mine for a long time, and I knew you and considered you a friend. Otherwise, I wouldn't have invited you in my home that night. I mean, I get it, you guys were on drugs, but I still didn't know why. It's not the drugs, bro. Yeah. It's not, the, like, I hate it when the drugs come up. That was me that did that. That yeah. was me who yeah, made that action. It, 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 it's drugs, I'm not trying to make excuses for you by any means, but I mean, I know what amphetamines can do and the psychosis and the stuff that comes with it and the anger. I mean, that's a, you know that beast. It's a beast. And what it did is uh, it unlocked all of my damage, bro. I was in a psychotic state and I did something, you know, that I can't take back because it was my choice to use. Mm -hmm. And therefore it was my choice that sure. this happened. Like all of yeah. those choices are ours all the yeah, time, you know, yeah. so. Did you, you had never met Pat beyond that night, right? I know. Did you remember his image at all? Do you remember what he looked like? I, I do. I do. Oh. You know, being a visual person, I sure. do remember. Uh, yeah, he was a, a hippie at heart. He was just an amazing musician, a guy that shined with light. He, he really was. I mean, he's one of these guys you look at him and it's like, man, that guy's got some spirit, something spiritual about him, you know? You know, I wish you would have had the chance to really get to know him because maybe you would have second guessed your, your you know, Definitely. your decision of, of robbing and killing us, you know? And I don't remember any kind of bad blood when you and Josh were at the house. It wasn't like that for on our end. Like it was, uh, uh, as as we go into this space, brother. You know, uh, you know, this is this is the heavy lift. What, what do you want out of this, brother? Like, I what, just want the truth. You want the truth? From, yeah. Okay, so do you, do you want to share the way that you perceive it, or do you want me to just to say the I'll tell you exactly what happened. I woke up, and you were at the foot of my bed. I sat up, and you pulled out a pistol and shot me twice. That quick. Didn't say a word, nothing. Knocked me over on my bed. I bled there for a while. I sat up in bed, hit my light, spit out a mouthful of blood, and I could hear you guys in the front yard loading up the safe in, in my driveway. And then I went to the living room and Patrick was laying on the couch and his head was kind of at an awkward angle on the armrest of the couch. So obviously, and what I think happened is he sat up and on the couch to you guys and you shot him and he just fell back over, is what I think. 
Unless you guys sat him down on the couch at gunpoint and executed him there. No. Uh, <sighs> and, and let me just interject a, a little bit here because uh, both of you know that you have different memories of that night. There's different accounts yeah. of that. I mean, there is no reason for me to lie. I could have had every right to defend myself. And you said I pulled out a gun. It didn't happen. The evidence is clear, though. I was shot through the shoulder and went through the wall right next to my bed. I fell over on the bed. There's blood all over on my bed. The two casings from the two different guns that Pat was shot with were in the living room. Two casings from the 32 that he shot me with were in the bedroom. So the, the evidence is really clear. And that's why they're convicted. I've shared with you that I, I feel like both of you believe exactly what you are remembering happened. Do you want him now to, to... Sure. Yeah, I'd like to hear your version. This is what I did. This is what I did. We had a plan. And our intention was to take both of your lives and then take your stuff. How did you get in the house? Patrick let us in the house that night. Really? I, we knocked on the door and Patrick let us in. Okay. He went back to the couch and he laid back down. I went into your room and you had woken up, you had the gun in your hand and you, you, you looked at me and you realized it was me and because I'm your friend, you put it back down. And as soon as you leaned back, you rested, you rested yourself back like this, and that's when I shot you. And I shot you in your armpit. You rolled over to the side, and I thought that I'd hidden you center mass. At that point, the gunshot goes off in the other room. And Josh starts running through the house yelling, so I almost think he's gotten shot. So instead of focusing on you, I, I dart out there. And as soon as I see Patrick getting up off the couch, I shot him, and he, he dropped immediately. I hear a gunshot in your room, and I see the flash. I walk into your room, coming back into it. You're sitting at the edge of your bed. You have the gun in your hand like this. You raise it up. You pull the trigger. It doesn't go off. Mm -hmm. I, shot you, I shot at you three times. I hit you twice. You were unconscious on the bed when you fell back. I put the gun on your chest and I was gonna pull the trigger again. Josh came in and turned on the light and he freaked out, get the, get, get the safe, get the safe, get the safe. So I got distracted and I grabbed your, your Mac-10 off the bed and I grabbed your money off of the dresser next door. I ran out to the car, I came back in and I started picking up the safe and, and then left out of the house with the safe. That is exactly what happened that night. You know? Wow. Yeah, I have no memory other than sitting up and getting shot. That moment lingers in my mind, brother. Sure. It, 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 the sound of it, everything, brother, you know, like it, it lingers in my spirit. Right. So there's no saving face in this, brother. You yeah, know, I like, know. like, you know, it is what it is and it's some ugly shit. And I feel awful about Patrick's life. I feel awful that I hurt you with that moment. Yeah. It's, it's just the betrayal and there's the help. It's an awful thing to do to somebody, brother. And I, and I genuinely am sorry that that's the truth. That's what happened that night, brother. I just remember sitting up and seeing you there and, and, and then wham, I didn't even know. I mean, if that's what happened, it's completely gone from my memory. But you know, I was shot in the, it was like getting hit by a boxer in the sweet spot. It knocked me out. You were unconscious. Yeah, it knocked me completely out. You were completely unconscious and you weren't expecting the first round. Yeah. In that moment, brother, you couldn't have been any more courageous than to sit up in that situation and just defend your friend's life and to defend your life. Yeah, I have no memory of it. You did, Absolutely, I know. you did, brother. You had heart in that situation, yeah. brother. And I want you to know that. I want you to know that you stood up for Patrick. You, you weren't there for that moment, brother. And, I, and as soon as I really got to slowing down and thinking like, oh, he, when I really understood that you believed what you were saying, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, 
man, I, all these years I thought that that account was given to help the DA convict me or something. Like mm -hmm. I, I was like, you know, like I just really didn't understand that that you believed that. Yeah. You know? So I'm, I'm just, I'm just grateful that you understand what really happened that night. And I'm sorry that I put you in that moment. Thank you. I took Patrick's life, who was obviously an amazing person. He was. And, and trust me when I say it lingers in me, brother. I know, I know it does. I know what I did to that man and his family. Yeah. He was a special person. He was. And to see what kind of person you are today, it, it, it just reminds me of the potential of his life that he could have had too. And to know that it's not here because of me. Thank you, Christian. And, and give yourself credit. You've done a lot of work, you know, and don't beat yourself up with the guilt. Let it go, man. Let it go. You shouldn't be defined by that act as a 19 year old kid, you know, on drugs. My hope is, you know, that the, the, the feeling that guilt that you carry, it gets easier. I know you will know, carry it. I still do a lot of the stuff that I've made amends for and, and actually receive forgiveness like we are now. I still carry a little bit of that guilt. I'm not sure if I ever want it to go away, brother. You know, I feel like Patrick deserves that. I feel like, like, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. That's part of it, bro. That, that I feel those things for him. And I know that, that his family feels those things too. And I know you feel those things. So, so, so a lot of it for me, is in knowing that you, as you have peace, and I see this wholeness in you and this well-being, brother, the fact that you're sitting in this room, you know, it, uh, that part does heal me, brother. That part does give me peace, and I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I'm proud of you, man. I'm proud of the work you did. I know it's not easy. It's like swimming upstream, you know? It does feel it, like to, that. It, 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 <laughs> it does feel like that. I know how it is, so. I'm amazed that I'm in here, you know what I mean? Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, at least hey, it must be nice to come in and go. You yeah, know? Hey, yeah, that must be. It hasn't it happened yet, though. Yeah. Yeah. Keep on doing that work, man. Doing the good work, all right? Uh, you will stay in touch for sure. I mean, basically, you're just looking at two Olympic level performances in terms of just human potential. I mean, to see somebody say, listen, we were kids, let it go. I mean, I, I think there's not a person in the world that can't take inspiration from that. I mean, like literally, I've got people who I won't speak to from, from high school over stuff. I can't even remember what it was. And you live with that for 20 years, 30 years. We don't have to live that way. This stuff just shows you what's possible. So that was um, about, I don't know, 10 minutes of a four-hour conversation. So it's really hard to capture everything that transpired um, in a few sound bites. But my takeaway from it was I saw Christian's remorse. I saw the person he is today. I saw his humanity. I saw his potential. Um, it was probably six months. Oh, God, I'm going to cry. Uh, uh -huh six months after we did our victim offender dialogue that I received a call from victim services that he was going to receive, he was going to get a com, uh, commutation from governor Brown. And I don't think they expected my, my response. I said, great. How can I, you know, advocate for him? Um, and so I was really adamant to go to his first parole hearing and I did, and I wrote a letter of support as well. Um, and, and fought really hard to, to get Christian out and he was found suitable. And what's shocking is even though I supported him because I was a direct survivor, the day he was released from custody, we could have no communication. He couldn't send me an email. I couldn't send him an email. It would violate his terms of supervision because I was a survivor. So we had to really, I had to advocate with parole to have that special condition removed from um, him so we could go back into prisons and work with people and do some restorative justice work. Um, 
It took about a few months, and then eventually we were able to go back into Lancaster together. And, you know, I never envisioned a friendship growing out of this. I thought we would, sorry, that we would uh, collaborate on restorative justice and do this work because I believe it's very important. Um, but we ended up getting a chance to speak at Columbia University um, right before COVID. Um, we flew out there. And, you know, at this point, my wife had not ever met Christian. And, and unfortunately, I'm a bad communicator. She knew we were going out there to do a presentation, but I didn't communicate that we're staying in the same Airbnb. And like a week before, I'm like, what room do you think Christian would want? What room should we get? And she's like, wait, we're staying with this guy who tried to kill you? Absolutely not. And um, at the time, I was a student assistant here making pennies. And I was like, oh, God, I got to get another hotel for the weekend in New York. And um, finally, she relented. And she said, don't expect me to be nice to him. And like me, she was a student. I'll just be in my room studying. The first night we were there, Christian and me are at the dinner table. And we're just talking about restorative justice. He's being who he is, showing compassion, just being genuine, showing his remorse. And my wife comes into the kitchen and she's making something to eat and kind of listening to the conversation. And the next thing you know, she's sitting at the table engaged in the conversation. And that three days in New York, we were inseparable and a friendship grew between her and Christian and myself, of course. And it just shows what's missing in our justice system. We lose the human element. We fail to see the human, the whole human um, after a crime occurs. And we just focus in on that act. And I think um, we, that's something that we need as a society not, to not forget the whole human. Christian had a lifetime of trauma. Um, and um, unfortunately, it manifested itself in violence. And, um, and I think we really need to understand that and to heal, to address that. So I'll have Christian kind of give some of the postscript. Um, oh, let's see if you're, try to unmute and see is, if it's working. So were you able to troubleshoot it? Okay, let me call you. It works. That's the one thing you learn in prison is to be resourceful. Yeah. I'm going to take my headphones and hopefully that takes away the uh, echo. Yeah. All right. All right. So can you hear me? I can. All right. All right. Well, as always, watching that is just like, oof, you know, it's, uh, I don't think I've gotten through it. <laughs> One time when I just choked me up because it's such an intense experience to, to draw from. But I will say that it's motivated me and it continues to motivate me. And, you know, Gunner's mercy and his generosity is uh, deeply moving, obviously. And to have somebody come to a parole hearing and fight for you, it, it, it is the most uh, hard wrench you pay to, to remember, to feel. And I, I always think it's, it's kind of funny when people talk about, you know, they think somebody's getting away with something when somebody forgives you. I promise you the most intense feeling is somebody having the capacity to give you a chance for mercy because I didn't deserve it, but he gave it to me anyway. And, and I think that that is what we, what we miss in our communities when we don't have the ability Mute this thing. Um, when we don't have the ability to see how this engagement affects everyone involved in it, every step of the way, Gutter has has been a tremendous and amazing human being, and shown that we all have the capacity to overcome deeply rooted trauma. And I I remember. You know, Gunnar sharing with me after we got together and we started developing this friendship that is completely unbelievable. That before this time frame, he used to wake up with like night terrors and things on the anniversary of our our crime. You know, the crime I committed. And after we got together, that went away. And I can't tell you how much that meant to me that that somehow he took something away from this that allowed him to not suffer because of something I couldn't handle. I couldn't handle my pain, so I hurt him. And in doing so, he had to live with what I had done. And so these, you know, these interactions and, and nobody's getting off the hook. You know, it's it's giving the most that we can to each other so that we don't have to live inside of that space for the rest of our lives. And 
gosh, I haven't seen that video in a while. It really uh, hit me again. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, and I, I think a really important point is, you know, we talk about the ripple effect of crime. We're well aware of how crime impacts our communities. Um, you know, people who live in a state of fear because it's um, amplified sometimes through the media or if you've ever been directly impacted by crime. Um, one of the things too was, you know, my mom was always, you know, respected that I did this, but was adamant. Like she would never forgive Christian. You know, he put her son on life support. And, um, and I wrapped up my graduate program last May and Christian came to my graduation and we parked in the same parking lot. And as we we're walking to the golden one, my mom, kind of laid into him. This is the first interaction they had. And she was 42 years old at the time of the crime at a kind of high risk pregnancy and kind of just really gave it to Christian. And he sat there, you know, and took it and, and just showed remorse and return. And by the time I had to leave to go stage for graduation, the three of us were crying and hugging each other. And then we went out to dinner afterwards and, and they engaged. So just seeing his humanity, seeing him for who he is today allowed my mom to get past 25 years of trauma. And um, I think that's the really uh, thing that uh, restorative justice can offer is a dialogue where people that have been harmed, and it doesn't mean you have to forgive the person, but you can at least acknowledge their growth and see their remorse. The justice system, you don't get that. And oftentimes, like Christian said, when you lean into someone with compassion, they feel the weight more of what they did. If you're mad at them, the justice system hand, you know, hand, hand that gavel down and you get 20 years, you get defensive. You start feeling like the victim because I've been on both ends of it. And, and what in criminology, they call it the techniques of neutralization where you blame the person you harmed, you blame the people around you. I blame my parents for years. Um, you know, it was always a way to deflect from taking accountability for what I had done. And then once you get into this place where you can feel the weight of harm that you cause, that helps you grow. That's how we grow as you know humans. And I think that um, the restorative justice allowed us to tap into that, to really um, kind of lean into that and, and process those trauma. Like Christian said, I used to have reoccurring nightmares um, that I'd be in a shootout, my gun wouldn't work, or I'd wake up you know, just in a state of a frantic state. I haven't had that in the last five years since we had our victim offender dialogue. And I did a lot of healing work. The genesis of the work that I did to forgive Christian was through the 12 steps. I got a sponsor, went through my resentment list. At the top of the list is Christian and Joshua Richter, his co-defendant. And I remember my sponsor telling me that I had to pray for them and let go of that anger. And I thought it was absurd. I said, I have every right to be angry at these guys, right? They broke in my house. They shot me and killed my friend. And he quoted something out of A's literature. And of course, it's dated and gendered, but it's um, justifiable anger is the dubious luxury of better men. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? All right. So, um, I, yeah. It, and, and I started to take my sponsor's advice and, and started to pray for their well-being. Kind of disingenuous at first, but I started to wonder, you know, I was doing a long sentence, but they were doing forever. Life without. Death by incarceration. And I started to think, what is that like? What would that do to a person at the age of 19 to know that the rest of your life is going to be incarcerated? So I, I think a little seed of empathy came. And through that, when I got out, I had reached out to Christian's sister um, who crossed the aisle um, during the trial and gave me a hug, you know, tearful hug. And if anybody's ever been in a, um, a, a trial situation where there's opposing sides, you don't do that, right? It's almost like a, a battle and it's so divisive and so adversarial. And that resonated with me. So when I got out, I reached out to Jennifer and let her know that to tell Christian I forgive him and I hope he finds a peace and sense of purpose. Um, while he's incarcerated. And uh, do you want to explain how you actually got that message from Jennifer? Well, it, it came through a, an interesting, so while I was inside, I much, it's, it, it's almost like that parallel paths. Gunner is doing his sobriety work and I'm doing my self work on myself, trying to figure out how to live in my own skin and what that means. And then along the way, I came to a point to where I realized that when you can't feel your own pain, you can't relate to somebody else's. And as soon as I unpacked my trauma and my pain, and I realized that I had punished Gunner and many other people in my life for the things that I couldn't deal with, I 
wanted to make amends. I wanted to reach out. I wanted to give back to Patrick's family and do something that actually might mitigate the pain and the harm that I had caused. And so I built a uh, restorative justice amends group, which doesn't exist even now in prison. It was a very one-off type thing. And we spent a year and a half unpacking what, how I rationalized this and how I thought I was going to redeem myself and, and facing the, my greatest fears, the things that I would have rather killed somebody than face, that I'd rather go to prison or die for than to then look at these things. It was the only thing that I thought held value that I could give uh, as an amiss, especially being incarcerated. So after a year and a half of, of doing this course, well, Gunnar had reached out to my sister long before that, and I had no idea. And I shared with my sister, who I was a little strange with, we didn't talk a lot. And she didn't think that I would want to hear from Gunnar because she was thinking of me as the younger version of myself. And and I expressed to her this heartfelt desire to give this amends to, to Gunnar and to reach out to him you know, on my behalf because it was illegal for me to actually try to reach out to him directly. And she goes, well, you know, it's kind of a funny thing. He actually already <laughs> reached out and said, that he forgives you and that he wishes that you do okay inside prison. And of course, this was such a relief and a huge opportunity to be able to give what I had been working on to him in hopes that just that he would be able to receive it. It was just this amazing moment where it was like, I get to give him this work because he deserves it. He needs to know that the last time he saw me in court and Patrick's family's up on, on the stand and I'm, mad dog in the family as they explain their loss and I they actually stopped that part of the hearing because I was so rude um it, it was just the most awful way to leave something after I think it's almost worse than the crime I committed to to not have regard for the loss I created and so it was really important for, for for him to know and I wanted Patrick's family to know that I have deep remorse now for what I had done and that I hope that he's having his best life too and and the uh so it ended up being a, a tremendous building block for us to have the moment that you just saw on the screen. Um, so really quickly, a little postscript. Um, oh, God, has it been two years almost? When did you get married? Almost two years ago. Yeah, so uh, a few years ago, I was the best man at Christian's wedding. Um, like I said, he came up to my graduation. We've become very, very close friends. Um, and it kind of... Like I said, it was an unforeseen consequence of the work that we do. I never envisioned that. I thought, you know, we'll do some work in restorative justice, but he is a remarkable human, and I saw that. And um, and I, I I was adamant. I remember the last we had closing remarks. Uh, you know, when we were finished with our victim offender dialogue, and I'm going to use the language. I excuse me in advance, but they said any closing thoughts. I said, yeah, let's get this guy the fuck out of here. Like he deserves a shot in uh, to come back to society. And um, at that time, he had no opportunity to come home. Life without possibility of parole it means you're going to die in prison. And then Governor Brown um, recognized, like it said, his rehabilitative efforts and gave him that shot. And I, he's been out several years and doing remarkable work and, and just, you know, he is a remarkable human being. And I think that, and it's not, he's not an exception to the rule. There is a lot of untapped potential that exists within our criminal justice system. People that have been sentenced to extreme sentences that have turned their lives around in there and that they don't have a viable path to come home. And that's a shame. It's a, a, and so the work I do today, I do two things. I work with Insight Garden Program, which is a horticultural therapy program within our California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. We really, we plant gardens inside the prisons and do a lot of environmental science, a lot of what we call the inner gardening work is that introspective work. Um, if anybody's ever got the opportunity to visit, I know a few of you have already from conversations, visit some of our correctional institutions. They're really a nature deficit in there. So when you put a garden in there, people gravitate towards it. And our participants really almost get possessive over the plants that they plant. Like that's my sunflower. But you see a lot of guys in there and myself included uh, that, you know, that's like toxic masculinity exists within our prison systems. And you'll see a butterfly or a hummingbird fly into the garden and, a, you know, a guy with a tattoo on his face and this smile comes out and you can just see that child in there in their true humanity. And so that's what we need to tap into and, and try to break through the layers of trauma. And then the other work I do, uh, I was the direct beneficiary of Project Rebound, 
which is a support program that started in 1967 by the late Dr. John Irwin, who also did time for armed robbery. And it's a support program throughout our California State University system for formerly incarcerated students. So like I said, my parents were college professors. Education meant everything. I had an eighth grade education when I went to prison. Um, I got my GED in Lompoc Federal Prison. My stepdad, who was an English lit professor, started sending me first like John Grisham and John Krakauer and eventually Tolstoy and Dostoyevsky and Faulkner. So he gradually got me up into some more challenging literature and I was able to go back to school. And I got, a, you know, I graduated my associate's degree um, with honors. I always told my mom she should have got a bumper sticker that says my son's an honor student in federal prison. But um, so I, I didn't know what I was going to do when I got out. All I've ever done is grown and sold pot. And, and um, but I knew I could be a student. So through the help of Project Rebound, I was able to enroll here at Sacramento State. I graduated summa cum laude in 2019. And I just wrapped up my master's degree and I'm actually studying for the LSAT to go into a JD program, hopefully at McGeorge. And, and, oh, thank you. And there's a ton of our students that are doing these things. Um, we just had a guy after 35 years, he got out his last semester. We teach two comms programs at Mule Creek and Folsom State Prison that are four-year degree track programs. And one of our students just released his last semester um, in, in that program after 35 years and was accepted into the grad program next for the next fall. And these are not exceptions to the rule. There are, there's so much potential that exists within our prison system. And I think um, as a society, we need to learn how to tap into that and create pathways for those that have done the work like Christian and myself to come home earlier. Um, granted, I know we, I needed an adult timeout when I was using drugs and doing what I did, but I didn't need 260 months, which was my initial sentence. I actually got into, I won my appeal, but that's another story. I got out of five years early. Um, Christian, do you have any closing thoughts before we do Q&A? Um, I, I would like to say on the, the idea of, of transformation, which is what I hear you kind of like explaining is, I, I ran a lot of self-help groups inside where we unpack this, and especially in the, in the men's group that we developed. So many guys at the beginning of it would sit down with me and go, hey, you know, I, I really want to have remorse but you know i really don't you know this guy was a gang member we shot at each other he died like it was a fair thing you know like why, why would i have remorse for something when i was fighting for my life and through the process of going through their childhood every single guy that was in the circle is somebody that had taken a life and in the beginning i'd say okay we're going to talk about one to five years old tell me about your life and they're like hey i had a great life and i said okay we're going to stop right now and i'm going to tell you if you're sitting in this circle you didn't have a good childhood so we need to back up and really reframe and look at what it is that we have done and what has been done to us and how we adapted to it. And by the end of this journey with every single group that I did this with, they found, I mean, they would just, they would have the most intense response to, to what they had done and what had been done to them. And but the, the thing across the board was if somebody isn't allowed to feel their own pain, they cannot relate to others. Our empathy, our humanity is centered through the idea and the feeling that we can actually relate to ourselves. If I shut off my pain, I shut off all of my emotion. You can't just shut off one emotion. And in that process, unpacking that pain opens the door for all of the things that we wanna see in ourselves, in our communities and across the board. And especially for the people that have survived our crimes or people that have survived a violent crime, we cannot, actually take them outside of their pain if the first feeling that you have afterwards is anger. If 20 years later you're stuck in a state of anger, they're also stilted in their healing process if we don't reach out to them and give them things that actually help them heal, support them in a real way, and change that public narrative that restricts both sides' access to healing. So I would just like to say that there is a tremendous potential for healing and a lot of it rests in our public narrative and how we approach this healing process of one another. Thank you, Christian. Q and A. Good open Q and A. You raise your hand if you got a question. Uh, I may have missed it, but when was the last time you saw Christian or you guys met and uh, are you still doing uh, things together? Yeah, um, so I was just down in Pasadena where Christian lives um, to go to Lancaster for uh, an event with Project Rebound. I stayed with him for what, five days while I was in town. 
and when Christian comes up here, he stays with me. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the we're as often as I can get down to LA, I, I go and see him. I actually went down for a project rebound retreat in Lake Arrowhead, and unfortunately, Christian was in Hawaii, or else I would have at least uh, gone and visited him. Two questions. First is, um, you really haven't defined restorative justice. And number two, do you believe in sociopathy, that there are sociopaths who can't be uh, redeemed? That's a good question. So restorative justice is, a, it, there is like no solid definition. You can talk to Mark Umbright or say, um, uh, Howard Zur, some of the you know founders, of, not really founders, because it comes from an indigenous practice. But um, restorative justice has a lot of different meanings. So really the goal of restorative justice is to allow the person that caused harm to feel reconnected with society. Because the only way we can hurt another person is if we don't feel connected to them, if we other them in some way. And, and um, to help people reintegrate in a way where they feel that connection. They don't wanna break that bond, that social obligation that we all try to carry. Um, another, there's a bunch of different avenues for restorative justice. One of them is making you know educational opportunities more prevalent inside prison. Um, one of them is planting a garden where people don't have access to nature. Another is where you bring first people that have been harmed and the people that have caused harm together to have a healing dialogue. Uh, and um, I just, I, what I found throughout my work in restorative justice, and I, I interviewed eight group pairs of survivors and the people that directly harmed them, is that not everybody became friends like Christian and myself. Um, but uh, some did, but everybody, um, all the survivors were invested in some way in the well-being of the person that had harmed them. And that's remarkable. They got beyond their anger. Like Christian said, a lot of survivors 20 years later are still stuck in that initial stage of grief, which is anger. They haven't give, been given the opportunity to heal in any way, unless they have the resources to go to therapy or something like that. It's really hard to get, and then we also have this concept in our society of somebody harms somebody that we love, we're obligated to hate the person that harmed them. That's like an obligation that we hold or else we're dishonoring the memory of the person that we lost, right? And that does you a disservice. It's not helping, you know, it's not hurting the person that harmed them. Matter of fact, in my instance, it harmed the people around me and harmed myself because I lived in that state of anger. So the ultimate goal of restorative justice is to help the survivors, the people that caused harm to heal and feel connected with their communities. Um, yeah, and then I, as far as sociopaths, I've met inside people that, like Christian said, have no connection emotionally to other people. Um, one in particular I know was, um, grew up in an orphanage, um, really like lived in a state in a crib where he was not attended to. Um, so I think, it, it, I'm, I'm sure there's people that have that clinical diagnosis, um, but in his case, it was definitely, uh, if you're looking at nature versus nurture, it was nurture that brought it about. That being said, he was a friend. I knew him, I talked to him, but um, you know, uh, I could tell, like he just uh, did not have a, a connection, emotional connection to people. Add to the psychopathy statement. Are you there gonna? Yeah, you're on. So I, when it comes to psychopathy, and I, I think that a lot of these things in the future will be reframed when we really look at what I was describing earlier, because barring like an actual physical injury to your brain where the free frontal cortex is actually your emotional connection isn't possible. I honestly believe that just about any person, as long as they have the biological capacity, will choose human connection if they see it as an option. And when we look at shame and how we process shame and how we trauma reenact, and you look at that process, I honestly think that that's what psychopathy is for the most part, especially antisocial behavior. So when you look at somebody that is emotionally removed, they're obviously going to be apathetic. If they're connected to themselves again, though, they're connected to their humanity. But if the very ethics that they learn, the shame ethics that they learn from the trauma itself says, hey, if you knock me on my butt, I know two things. I'm weak and you're strong. And if I don't want to feel weak, then I have to be like you. If I define strength by my weakness, 
By my weakest moment, I learn what the idea of strength is. I'm actually trapped in this trauma cycle because I'm always trying to elevate my way out of it by doing the very thing that was done to me. And so this cycle perpetuates into greater and greater levels of aggression and violence because it works for a moment, just like any addiction, and then it wears off. And then we return back to this sense of insecurity or the fear that we felt in the very initial traumatization. So I think that there's, you know, I would love to, to get deeper into the, what a, you know, a psych, the, the side effects of what people think a psychopath is and then compare that to what I'm talking about. And I would say that probably 90% of the symptoms that is associated with psychopathy relates to these issues and those things are reversible. And I've seen, I've seen those things happen in those circles. Thank you for both for sharing. It's been very moving. Is this restorative justice opportunity available in all state prisons? or only where there's a sponsor or mentor or coach available? And how about the county jail system? That's a great question. So it's growing. Um, in California, it was virtually non-existent. Um, we were one of the first few groups of people that actually did victim offender dialogues in California. They've had robust systems in Texas, of all places, and Ohio for a long time. And um, you know, it, it's growing though. So like the day of Christian's parole hearing, I, I went down and advocated and then went right to a film screening with Van Jones of, of advanced screening of this. And there was representatives from the governor's staff and stuff. And um, a few months later, we got a couple million dollar investment in restorative justice. And Dr. Awazi just was actually connected in with a grant to do training for VOD facilitators here at Sacramento State. Um, so it is a growing movement. And one of the things I, one of the questions I posed in my thesis was, is there a way to start the healing right from the point of the crime where there's a mediator, not necessarily to bring the two parties together, but to at least help people deal with the trauma? Because um, victim services, their, their resources are pretty barren. And, um, and ultimately, we just are, we're lacking that. As an example, when I went to trial, and uh, had to testify and was shown these pictures of my friend dead on my couch and relive this most traumatic experience, I have to walk off the stand, get in my car and drive home in this like numb state. And that happens to all survivors. There's like a lack of compassion. And um, we really need to fill that gap in some way. I couldn't agree more. I, I think with most of the restorative justice I've seen inside was very limited. We had a, a, an amazing opportunity to to preserve it on the CNN special, or and I think up to that date, and I think they showed it on the full length special. It was like there it was under like twenty people in all of California to ever even have this opportunity. Period. At that point, you know, more have happened since then because of this uh, because of these types of shows airing. But in reality, like it was unheard of for a survivor and offender to connect inside. And just a side note, I am scheduled to have a victim offender dialogue with uh, Christian's co-defendant, Joshua, I think in May or August, that uh, Dr. Wazi is actually facilitating. And this is our last question. I'd like to give a special welcome to Chris, who I knew as a teenager when I was known as Ben's mom. Oh, you're Benny's mom? <laughs> the guitar player, Benny? Yeah. Ben Gollum's mom? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I know Benny. <laughs> you know Ben, too? Oh, yeah. yeah. And of course, I remember those days, and it brings a question to mind about intervention at those earlier ages and whether and how you might do that. Well, I, I would say that the work that I do right now is centered around that very notion, which is I, I found to be shame to be the center of all violence. Uh, I find it to be the catalyst for it. I see it as the nucleus of of the addiction cycle, a trauma cycle, a shame cycle, it's, it's synonymous. It's all the same thing. And, and through my healing journey, I realized that we self-isolate when we have shame because if inside of me, when I was a kid, you could have reached out and been loving and kind to me, but the deepest part of me always knew, like if you knew this about me, then you wouldn't love me. You wouldn't be kind to me. You wouldn't. So I self-isolated myself. I pulled myself away. And in that isolation, we become defensive, we're very vulnerable, insecure, 
And if that shame ethic that you develop because of your trauma says violence is the only way to redeem yourself, then that sets you on a whole journey to where you're going to end up in prison or somebody's going to get really hurt because you're isolating yourself. Your, your form of redemption is violence. And that's your addiction cycle is violence. So the work that I do really focuses on how do we get to a point to where our public narrative isn't shameful? How do we allow people to have their experiences and have clear paths to redemption? How is it that we can reconnect and allow people to accept them wherever they're at in their journey? And, and so I do a lot of work based on this, and it's really important to, to show that it is a strength to give mercy. And one of the things I've learned from Gunner, which was deeply impactful to me, was that mercy, I, and, I, and I said it earlier, and I really mean it, like I don't deserve what he gives me. It's not something that I have a right to. I did something that, that permanently and irrevocably hurt a lot of people. But in doing that for himself, allowing him to give mercy is a strength. It shows resilience. And more importantly, he isn't trapped in that trauma anymore because he had the courage and the strength to do that. So I think when we start looking at all of these things, shame, mercy, resilience, this idea of what interconnection is, and I think to simplify it and the easiest way to communicate to people is that all things that make you feel separate from any other human being is trauma. And anything that allows you to feel interconnected or to extend interconnection is healing. It is just that simple. Thank you. See you, Ms. Gullip. <laughs> it is really, I mean, I don't see you, but I hear you. And it's just, I, I remember reaching out to Ben as soon as I got out. I, I love you guys, and you guys are amazing people. You guys were probably the best thing that I had in my life as a kid. I, I love you guys so much. So I know we had a question on the chat, and that was, is any of this written down, this whole story that you've shared? Um, we're maybe working on it. I, I mean, you know, we, we do a lot of collaboration. I just finished a thesis. Um, but we're talking about writing it down. Uh, we do a lot of speaking together. Um, I, I think it's important. And it's also, I don't want us to say like our experience is unique. It does happen. It's just, there's not a lot of pathways for people to find this. And, and that's where we're, we're missing the mark. So hopefully that can bring it to light. And I just really want to touch on intervention because I work in, in YDF in the U, ju, juvenile facility. And that is where we really need to change minds and hearts and work and lean in. And thankfully, the mission for the juvenile justice system is rehabilitation. It's not punitive, where even though California Department of Corrections and rehabilitation, thank you, Larry, for that, for that contribution, still is, the main mission is punitive. And, um, and, and so hopefully, we can live up to that and make the system more rehabilitative. And, and I try every day when I go in there and work with the youth and try to bring educational opportunities to them. I want to thank both uh, Gunnar and Christian for being here today. Let's give them a round of applause. And if you want to know about more about the work they're doing, I encourage you to Google uh, Project Rebound. Uh, you can see at Sac State to talk about the, pro the projects they're doing here on campus. And uh, also, if you, if you Google uh, Christian Branscombe, you can see his website where he does counseling today. I wanted to ask a question, but it would have taken another hour, okay? But if you... I watched a podcast about an over an hour long talking in detail about Christian's trauma he went through as a child. There's no surprise that at 19, he shot somebody, okay? So if you watch that material online, you get an appreciation for how lives can be changed and how both these men today are bringing back to our communities and making a difference, right, for other people. So give another round of applause there.